This is classic, classic mistake leaders make. Don't mistake silence for agreement. You know, organizations that were incredibly psychologically unsafe, crashing down so many of mm. them. Any individual manager probably should not manage more than seven or eight people at a time. Getting extreme clarity from your manager on exactly what they expect and what beating their expectations looks like. The more that we're willing to show trust and be vulnerable and ask good questions, the more it rubs off on everyone else around us. So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It's a great way to spend a Tuesday morning. I think it's better than any other way to spend your Tuesday morning for today. My name is Ruby, and I'm the CEO and co-founder at Curious. I'm also the host of People People. And uh, a little bit intro introduction about People People. Uh, we are doing this as a series about the future of HR, the future of work, and we feature thought leaders from world-class um, company world-class business, um, and combined with Vietnam insights. And our mission is to elevate Vietnam's businesses and people to the next level. And this series is co-produced by Viet Success and Curious. Um, Viet Success, probably you've known them for a long time. They're very famous in the country. They, they are one of the leading media companies in Vietnam for high-quality edutainment content for business and professionals. And Curious is a startup. We are new, and we are building a new Um, social network for professional on-the-job learning. And today's topic is a topic that I really love and I'm learning a lot and practicing it to build my company. And it is about building psychological safety in your culture. And to talk about this topic, there's no one else that I know that is better to talk about this topic than the speaker today. Is um, I, I'm very honored to introduce Jennifer Dowski. She's a CEO and founder at Rising Team. She's a faculty at uh, Stanford GSB, board member of many international companies. Yeah, she's a best-selling author of Purposeful. It's a book about leadership and culture. And um, before this, she also has a wide range of executive experience, including lead leadership roles at Facebook, Google, and Yahoo. Wow. <laughs> Is there any, big tech, um, any more big tech company to work for? Uh, so I'm super honored. and. I'm super excited to introduce Jennifer today. And uh, Jennifer, we are all looking forward to hear from you. Thanks for having me. And it's lovely to meet you all. And yes, it's morning for you and nighttime for me. So it's a little dark where I am, but hopefully you can still see. And I am going to share a few slides. I have a, a short presentation about psychological safety, why it matters, how you can build it in your own teams. And then we'll go to Q&A. So get ready with any questions that you have. And one thing we'll learn about psychological safety is that there is no question that is too, you know, vulnerable or feels silly. The whole point is to try to make this a space where people feel safe to speak up. So let me share my screen. So today, as we talked about, we're going to discuss how to build a healthy workplace environment and culture with psychological safety. And this is critically important to all of us as leaders and managers as, and as individual contributors on a team to make an environment like this. Okay, so I'm Jen. Ruby introduced me a little bit already. I have been leading teams for 25 years at all different size companies. So I've led very large teams at Facebook and Google and Yahoo. And I've done two zero to one startups. This is my second one. So my current team, quite small, 20 people. And then I also helped scale change.org around the world. And as Ruby said, I now teach two classes also in leadership and management at the business school at Stanford. So I spend all my time thinking about high-performing teams and how I help people both on teams and leading teams be the best that they absolutely can be. So, you know, this is, it's important to have a successful team. The challenge is that we're living in a workplace that has really changed dramatically in the past two years. So even if you've been leading teams a long time, 
what you need to do today is really different than what we all needed to do, you know, three, five years ago, because we're in a world now where almost half of all employees are either thinking about leaving their jobs or quiet quitting their jobs and really demanding a lot more of their employers. We're also in a world where two thirds of all knowledge workers work either hybrid or fully remote. And also when you look at the data, there's a growing gap between how leadership feels, especially at large companies, and how everyday employees feel. And if you dig one level deeper into that and look at the data, this is global data on this chart on the X axis is things employers think are important. And on the Y axis, what employees think are important. And the items in this blue box are things that employees really care about that a lot of employers aren't really delivering on today, which is how do we make people feel valued by their organizations, feel valued by their manager, give them a sense of belonging, build up trust and care with the people they work with. And the challenge is that those are things you can't really do top down. You know, you can maybe if you're at a small company, but the bigger your company gets, the more you need to do this team by team, manager by manager. And, you know, having engaged teams, having psychological safety, you have to have managers who can deliver it. Most managers will tell you they don't really feel equipped. And that's part of the reason why learning, you know, um, is important, like the company that Curious is building. It's part of the reason why companies like Rising Team are important. So let's dig in a little bit deeper into what is psychological safety and why we need it. So the way this is defined, and Amy Edmondson is a professor at Harvard Business School. She's the person who coined this term. And we describe psychological safety as an environment where people believe that their candor is welcome that they can feel free to speak up without fear of repercussions, thinking nothing's going to happen to them if they speak up and say what they believe. And also where they have trust and feel comfortable potentially being vulnerable with each other. So that's what it means to have a psychologically safe culture. And then you ask, well, why why does it matter? Why does it matter if people feel trust with each other and, and feel free to speak up? It matters. So Google actually did a study of teams all around the world called Project Aristotle, and they found that the number one most important factor across teams that were high performing in their organization was psychological safety. So you could look at teams that felt like they had this, that they felt free to speak up and felt trust with each other and teams that didn't, they were vastly different in their performance. And Amy Edmondson, who studied this across all sorts of companies around the world, has shown in her research that teams with higher psychological safety have better teamwork, more innovation, they're more creative, they're more inclusive, and they also do a better job of preventing errors and mistakes. So that's why it matters. Then you ask, what happens when you don't have it? What if, you know, what is, so what? What if you just don't have it? Well, the first thing that happens is your employees and your teammates feel unhappy. They feel scared. They feel dissatisfied. They often leave. And so if you want high retaining, high, highly engaged teams and companies, you got to do it. That's at the kind of low end of not, of not really investing in it. At the extreme end of not having it, really bad things can happen to your company. So a couple examples here. This one you may or may not have seen because it was mainly in the US, but this is that Wells Fargo is a big bank in the US. They had a huge scandal a couple of years ago that is still plaguing them of um, all sorts of junior level employees creating not accounts that people didn't ask for. They created extra accounts under their customer's name because they were being so pressured from the top to drive new business. And no one in the middle spoke up and said, this is wrong. They all just let it happen. And all those junior people started these accounts and then they got found out and you know, it became a big, big problem with them. They owed billions of dollars and lost a lot of customers. And it was really tragic because their environment wasn't safe enough for people to speak up when they felt something was happening that was wrong. An even more dramatic example which I know you've all heard of, is the Boeing 737 MAX crashes. So the, that plane, Boeing knew, and there's a lot of data that shows that various people at various levels in their organization knew that the software was faulty and no one spoke up. This is a psychologically unsafe and workplace, right? They didn't feel safe enough to speak up and they let these mistakes through, which ended up causing two massive plane crashes and killing hundreds and hundreds of people. 
So we want organizations that have psychological safety for all kinds of reasons. They are the best, highest performing teams and companies. And if you don't have it, it can really lead to some very bad things. Okay, so I want to dig one level deeper and talk about there's actually four stages of psychological safety. So Tim Clark um, wrote a book called Four Stages of Psychological Safety, and he describes the stages. The first is what he calls inclusion safety. This means at the base level, before you get to full psychological safety, you have to help people feel included for what they bring to the table. That means whatever their strengths are, their talents, whatever their personal life may hold, and whatever attributes they have, people need to feel included and welcome and safe to speak up about those things on our teams. That's inclusion safety. The second stage is the learner safety. This is once you feel included and that you're welcomed for whatever attributes you bring to the table. The second is being able to admit that we don't know everything and that we want to learn new things. So this is being willing to ask for help when we need it, asking questions, just like we said, no bad questions, like safe environment. We are all learners and we all want to grow together. Stage two is contributor safety. So once I feel included and I know I can ask for help, I'm ready to contribute. I have ideas that I want to share with the group and I need to feel safe to share those ideas and contribute without being afraid that someone will make fun of me, put down my idea, et cetera. And the fourth stage is challenger safety. This is what we talk about when we get to Boeing example, right? Like I need to be feel included, feel safe to ask for help, feel safe to contribute ideas, and I need to feel safe to challenge other people's ideas or you know things that we're building, things that may be mistakes. This is why we say psychologically safe teams are better at error prevention. And it doesn't, sometimes stage three and four seem like they contradict because you want to be safe to speak up with an idea without getting criticized. But at the same time, you want to be able to critique each other's ideas with, you know, fairness and openness and care for each other in a way that makes us get to the best ideas. So all ideas are welcome. And at the same time, challenges of those ideas are welcome until we get to the, the place we want to together. So those are the four stages of psychological safety. And we all have the power to build this. So I'm going to give you three steps that you can use to build psychological safety in your team. So the first is to set the stage and model the behavior. So when I say set the stage, the first thing we need to do is explain why it matters, why it matters that we have an open environment, just like we did today. So we know now why it matters because we talked about all the stats. And at the same time, we want to admit that there is uncertainty. So we know that it can be scary to bring up new ideas because we don't know that they'll always work. And part of being psychologically safe is to take risks and try new things. And so in setting the stage, I explain to my team both why it matters and how we'll get farther if we do it, and that we won't be right every time. We'll make mistakes together. We'll learn and take risks together. Second part of setting the stage is modeling the behavior. So psychological safety really works best when the leader models it first. So I, as a leader, have to start by being vulnerable, putting out ideas, asking questions, reacting well. So stage two is welcome all ideas. So the first rule of psychological safety is don't mistake silence for agreement. This is classic, classic mistake leaders make is nobody spoke up, nobody said anything, so they must all agree with me. That is definitely not true. And in fact, sometimes people don't speak up because they're afraid to speak up. So it is important to ask really good pointed questions, things like, what are we missing? Are there any ideas that haven't come up yet? You know, those kinds of questions that pull people out and make sure they know that you aren't taking their silence as agreement. The third technique I use here is to invite people to write down their ideas without just asking for them on the spot, especially for people who are more introverted. It's very hard to be in the middle of a meeting and have someone say, what are we missing here? And just have to reply in that moment. So instead, a technique you can use is to 
for instance, create a Google Doc and you can even do it in the meeting. You can say, what I what what do we think we're missing? Or what are some things about this idea that could go wrong? That's another example of a pointed, curious question. And you can ask people to just take five minutes to write down their ideas in a doc so that they don't have to speak on the spot and be pressured to think on the spot. That's number two. Number three is respond productively. So the key, key thing here is when you at, when you model the behavior and you ask the right questions, if people then speak up, you have to respond in a good way or else you'll shut the whole thing down. So the, the advice I give here first is try reflective listening. So instead of just responding with what you think, try just reflecting back what they said. Huh, I heard that you suggested this idea that maybe we should do X, Y, Z. That's interesting. Like just literally say back what they said to you. That validates their idea. And they might say more if you do that. The second is be curious, not judgmental. This is one of the favorite quotes from Ted Lasso for anyone who watched that show. I don't know if it's um, popular there, but Apple TV, great leadership show is the tell me more about that. So when someone says something, instead of, again, judging or or saying your own opinion, just say, tell me more about that idea and opening them up to, to tell more. And then um, this, I think we'll get to a little more in the Q&A, but the idea of celebrating mistakes and even failures can be a great way to encourage people to take more risks. Um, so those are three techniques, set the stage, model the behavior, welcome the ideas and respond productively for how you can do this in your own teams. Um, I'm going to tell you very quickly a little bit about Rising Team and what we do, because this is another thing that can help you um, if you want to build psychological safety and other techniques within your team. Um, so for people who are curious, what we built at Rising Team is what we call a team development platform. It's basically software that turns every manager into an expert facilitator of connecting meaningful team building experiences for your team. And they're around different themes. And each kit has a different theme. One of our kits is about psychological safety. And basically what it does is you just kind of hit go and everything that an outside facilitator would do for you, like learning goals and a warm-up activity and a, an interactive um, exercise and data aggregation and reminders and action items, they're all in the software for you to follow. And again, one of them is on psychological safety. And I will just say that it is pretty well proven to work. Also, Ruby and her team use it, so they may give you some feedback. But essentially, all teams that go through it, almost all of them, say that they feel more connected, they learn something valuable, and they'll work better together. If every time you ask a question, you get no responses back, that probably means people don't feel really comfortable to speak up. Any individual manager probably should not manage more than seven or eight people at a time. Only when people feel safe are they willing to take the big risks and try to do big things because they know that if they make a mistake or fail, it will be okay. Okay, so I thought here at this point, I don't know how, how open people are feeling for participation, but I thought I would um, try a, pra a little bit of practice together as a group. So I'm going to ask you, and I can't see the chat. Are people type writing questions or thoughts in the chat right now? Ruby, I see there are some comments. Jennifer, some people are sending private questions to me, so I'm going to curate those questions. <laughs> okay. You. I'm going to ask you all a question in the chat, though, right now, which is, on a scale of one to 10, if I asked you to tell a really vulnerable personal story right now about something that had happened to you at work, how likely would you be to want to share that right now in this session on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the most likely to want to share it and one being the least likely? Okay, so uh, a range, I see kind of a lot of people kind of in the middle, not sure, um, right? So what I'm going to do now is I am going to model a personal, vulnerable, work-related story. And I told Ruth, yeah, I was so sure about doing this, but I'm going to give it a try for the sake of, of our practice there session you go, here. So, yeah. we, have, we have your bikes. So... I'm going to tell you a story about when early in my career, when I worked at Yahoo, 
Okay, so this is me early in my career when I worked at Yahoo. I spent 10 years there early in my life, and that's my family. We were at a Yahoo picnic in this photo. One year, I had just had a big promotion. So I had been promoted from running one team to a whole like division of teams. And I was really excited about this promotion. I was also kind of upset because someone on another team had sent me like a really nasty email the the day before. And I was all stressed about this, this email. I took my team up to a, an offsite. We were at a winery because it was brand new team for me. And I was trying to build, you know, camaraderie on the team and so forth. And I got a call from my daughter's school. This is the daughter who's in the orange shirt that she had been in an accident on the playground at her school. She was essentially being rushed to the hospital. She had fallen on her head and was seriously injured. And I did not know what to do. I had taken the whole team. I mean, obviously there was only one choice, which was I had to go to the hospital and you know and check on my daughter. I had the whole team. We had all driven up there together. So I had to put the whole team back in the van. We all drove down the hill, rushed to the hospital. She was having a major seizure and she ended up, being an induced coma in the hospital. And they, you know, she had essentially traumatic brain injury and I did not know what was going to happen to her. And everybody on my brand new team had just seen me at my most vulnerable, weakest moment. And at that moment, it didn't matter. Like it just gave me so much clarity that it didn't matter. My promotion didn't matter. The nasty email I had gotten from someone at work didn't matter. She was actually in the ICU in a coma for several days. Wasn't sure if she was going to make it. And at that moment, it gave me so much clarity, both on what mattered to me in my life and also who I could trust, where the safety was in my own work environment. And luckily for all of us, she came out of the coma. She ended up having a full recovery. I should have put another picture in here because she just graduated from college last year. This was 2007, so it was a long time ago. And she made a full recovery. But I think for me, that moment changed how I thought about everything on the teams that I work with because I realized, and actually I'm going to ask one more question in the chat now. Well, I'll ask two more questions. One one question I often ask is how many people have been called or messaged about a serious medical or health issue, either about yourself or someone that's close to you while you've been at work? Put in the chat if that's a yes for you. So you can see it's kind of half and half here is what it looks like. Um, and also my guess is that you, you may have a slightly younger audience. So my guess is more, you know, this turns to yes for a lot of people as we go through our lives. And the amazing thing to me is when you ask a question like this, like we sometimes assume that we go through these things on our own and that no one else is affected by them. And then when you ask people, it turns out so many people are. And so part of the reason I tell stories like this is to make it okay for other people to come in and say, this stuff is happening to me. It's hard. It, you know, this is all actually part of that very first step of psychological safety, which is inclusion safety. So with that, I'm going to ask the question one more time. So now that I've told this story, go back to your one to tens. And just think about, does this change at all? And it may not, but if it changes at all, the number put in, you know, just put in your new number, if that changes at all, your willingness to tell a vulnerable story. Okay, I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to make everyone type in, but I think what we can see is that as is often the case, the more vulnerable one person is likely to be, is able to be, the more likely it makes other people feel comfortable to get into that space too. And so when I say, you know, it's on us to model this as leaders, it doesn't have to be super personal in the way I just told the story. That's the one I chose to tell, but it might be an example of a mistake we made at work or something we're struggling with or things like that, that make it easier for our team to also say, this is something I need help with, or I'm struggling with right now. So that is the end of my formal presentation. And now we can go to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for sharing your condensed wisdom in just 20 minutes and also sharing with us your vulnerable story. 
when I was listening to the story, my heart was pulling. I'm like, oh my God. And I'm glad to hear that uh, your, your daughter recovered well. Uh, that's great. And um, so let's uh, continue on that vulnerable story. Um, beyond that story, how often do you feel vulnerable as a leader in your team, in your company, whether it's your own company or other companies that you work for? Like, how often do you feel that? All the time. So I, I talk mm-hmm. about my analogy for work, for leadership and for work in general, is that it's like climbing a mountain. And some days are super sunny and I brought a picnic lunch and I can see the top of the mountain and I, I'm guaranteed that I'm reaching the top. And other days just feel horrible. Huge storm is coming. I feel like I'm way back at the bottom. And honestly, some days are both. You know, you might sign a big customer and then something bad happens. Your competitor launches something big and it can be back and forth and back and forth all the time. And I use this analogy now with my team a lot. And so we can all say, you know, sunny day or it's cloudy day on the mountain today. (laughs) And it just helps because it's a reality for all of us, no matter how far we get, no matter how successful we are, there's always cloudy days. And the key, and there's always sunny days too. Like the key here is remembering that both days will happen and that the key is just to keep moving, right? Like you just keep climbing one step at a time. And when it's sunny, appreciate it. Don't stop too long for a picnic. And when it's cloudy, just remember <laughs> it will get sunny again if you just keep going. So that's great to hear. Uh, recently, I've been go- going through a lot of cloudy days, and just hearing you yeah. talking about this just make me feel a lot more hopeful. It's and true. yeah, the clouds all clearing. have them. Um, let's get back to um, what you've been sharing in the presentation. There's one question that people ask uh, in advance of today's session is about measuring psychological safety. Right? How do you measure it? Like qualitatively yeah, so- and quantitatively. Quantitatively, it's pretty commonly measured through standard engagement surveys or pulse surveys. Big companies all measure this, but small companies can too. And in fact, we have a engagement survey as part of Rising Team that's, that comes with the product. But questions like, um, you know, do my opinions matter? Do I feel safe to speak up? My manager listens to my ideas. Those are questions that all actually get at measuring psychological safety. And so the key is to ask those questions, ask them anonymously. So you don't pressure people to say like, for instance, what we just did in the chat is probably not a good example because everyone had their name on it when they had to type in, when you measure this, you want to do it anonymously. Um, And you want to do it frequently enough that you have a good, you know, a good ongoing metric because these things can change rapidly if something happens in your organization that's bad. Um, the, in terms of qualitatively, I would say the biggest way in my experience is the silence question. So if every time you ask a question, you get no responses back, that probably means people don't feel really comfortable to speak up. And so we want to get to a place where, you know, I think about like when I worked at Facebook, they did, you know, Mark does a every Friday and now it's maybe Thursdays, but all hands where everybody can come and ask questions and it, and people ask questions with their names on them and people vote them up. Um, and yeah, the fact is, People are willing to stand up there with their name and ask a really hard question of the CEO. Like that's the environment you want. That's great. That's great. There's a great question in the chat as well from Fong. And he he, he talked about, um, we were talking about psychological safety from the employer side or leader side or the manager side. How about from the employee side? What can they do as an employee or individual contributor to build psychological safety? Yeah. So the same skills apply, right? So if your manager isn't doing it, you can actually step in and do those things like ask a key pointed question or use reflective listening back with someone else or share a vulnerable story. And I'd say in many environments... Even if your manager isn't doing it, they if they're open and learning, they would be accepting of that. There will be some environments that are extremely psychologically unsafe, where it will feel unsafe for, for individual contributors to do that too. And in that case, 
I would say those are the cases where you want to maybe try starting talking to your manager about why this matters and maybe bringing some data and so forth. And if you can't get past them, those are the times you want to pull in someone from HR probably to help support you. Mm, that's a great uh, advice. Psychological safety is a culture that uh, need to be built by everyone, not just that's true. the leaders or the HR or the manager, right? Um, so, true. At the end of the day, a leader cannot do this on their own. They yes. can create the space for it, but they need the individual contributors to be the ones speaking up, sharing ideas, etc. They can't do it by themselves. Continuing on that thread, right? I believe there's a lot to do with hiring, to bring bringing the right people who are willing to speak up, willing to be open-minded, willing to challenge uh, other people's point of view sometimes. So how much hiring has to do with this culture and how do you find the mm. right person to bring in to build this culture? Yeah. In my um, experience, the thing when you're hiring, I use a model of creating a hiring scorecard and the scorecard has two elements. One is results. Like we usually say, what does this role have to deliver and how can we measure whether the person will be likely to be able to deliver that? And the second, we we call it values. You can call it attributes. You can call it culture. We interview four specific values that tie to our company. And one of those may be, you know, for us, for instance, one of them is we grow through continuous learning and practice. So we look for people who actively want to learn, are willing to make mistakes, are willing to keep standing up after they fail and so forth. That's an example of someone who would do well in a psychologically safe environment. And we ask questions to try to pull out experiences from their past um, that show that. So as an example, I had someone in an interview once in the values interview where I was asking these kinds of questions and the story he told me, which was unbelievable to me at the time, was an example of something where he had found a big mistake that he had made in the code. This is an engineering interview. And he realized at that moment that he could fix it, not tell anyone, and probably it would go unnoticed. Hmm. And then he decided that he didn't want to do that. Even though he thought he could get away with it, he wanted to speak up and explain what, what had happened and what he had done and what he learned from it and so forth. And he talked about doing that and what happened. And to me, that was an excellent example of someone who would perform well in a psychologically safe environment because he was willing to speak up about, in this case, an error that he himself had made. That's the ext most extreme example of psychological safety. That's so a great example of integrity. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, so if a team doesn't have enough psychological safety because you just did a survey and there's signals that show so, right? Um, what are the steps you would recommend the team manager or the leader to take? And uh, if you're managing a small team versus you, if you're managing a big team, uh, will the steps be different? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'd say I would go back to the steps that I put in the presentation. So set the stage, model the behavior yourself, explain why it's important, model the behavior, ask key pointed questions, reflective listen, et cetera. Um, we have in Rising Team... When you do the session, we also have a list of, you know, more detailed follow-up steps you can use and things like that. So there's there's a lot of research out there about detailed kind of next steps you can take. I'd say for the, the difference between larger organizations and smaller ones, and even large, so there's two differences. One is larger teams. Like, first of all, my view is that um, any individual manager probably should not manage more than seven or eight people at a time. I know this is controversial, lots of flat organizations with lots of direct reports and no limited hierarchy, but it's hard to be a really good manager to too many people because you just don't have sufficient time to understand each one of them, coach them to their potential and so forth. So I'd say the first thing, if you have a really big team is try to split it up into a couple of groups of people. For large organizations, like if you're running a company that's hundreds or thousands of people, 
you can model this at the top and should in things like all hands meetings, for instance, but you can't deliver it on a day-to-day basis on each team. You have to train and empower your managers to do that individually. So Mm -hmm. that's the main thing at a big company is empower your managers. Don't try Mm -hmm. to do it all yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, The the next question is actually coming from me personally. (laughs) This is something I find hard to balance is to create and maintain and build up that uh, psychological safety. At the same time, I personally believe that I should push people to go beyond their comfort zone. And that's where they personally grow and the company grow as well, right? And I know these two are not like in conflict with each other. They're actually like com- complementary to each other, but it can be very hard for young leaders to balance this. So yes. I want to ask you for your personal experience. I'm sure you are... You, you have a little bit of uh, that ambition to push people <laughs> beyond their comfort zone as well. So how do you handle I, this? <laughs> yes. And I, yeah. you are exactly right. This is connected, deeply connected to the idea of psychological safety, because only when people feel safe, are they willing to take the big risks and try to do big things because they know that if they make a mistake or fail, it will be okay. The idea is how do you celebrate that learning as much as possible? So for we came up with this idea when I was at change.org and I've used it at every company since we call it the festival of failure. Uh-huh. And so the idea is, um, and that's a nice alliteration in English, but maybe you, you, you know, you'd have a different name for it that works in Vietnamese. But um, the idea is that you want to celebrate as much as possible whenever people make mistakes so that not only they learn from their mistakes, but everybody learns from their mistakes. So when someone fails, it's almost like, you know how sales teams have like a gong they ring when when they close yeah. a deal it's almost yeah. like you want a gong to ring when someone fails big right and <laughs> what we do we have a chat a slack channel called festival of failure we often have a section in our all hands meetings at change.org we had engineering demos where they would sometimes do nothing but present ideas that hadn't worked and so the oh. idea is the team gets into the idea of like Every time I do something that doesn't work, I'm going to present what I learned. And so as an example, at Rising Team, we have this learning engine um, newsletter that comes out. And every time we say, okay, here, here was the test we did. Here were the hypotheses. And if we meet the hypotheses, it gets the green check. And if we don't meet the hypotheses, it gets a red X. And I always say, the tests that have all red X's are just as productive for us as the team, as the tests with all green checks. Because when you learn something that doesn't work, it's just as helpful knowledge. And, you know, the, the famous person on this front is Thomas Edison, who, you know, when he was inventing the light bulb, he is famous for having said, I didn't fail. I just found 10,000 ways that wouldn't work. And in doing that, he created the key was the speed of failure, right? And that's often what tech is all about. So he ended up creating more than a thousand patents. It's essentially like one for every two weeks of his whole working career because he got that speed of failure and that feeling of it being okay to fail was so out in the open. And that's what makes this work. Wow, I love your idea. I'm going to adopt your idea. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, still a failure. Yeah. Take it. I see a question in the chat too. Yes, there's a question coming from uh, Fong. So Fong's question is, when the managers feel psycholog- psychologically unsafe, right? what are the, t- the actions that the teammates can do? Is that what I the question is? the context is? of this question is that uh, they feel unsafe because the team are not. Uh, oh, the team the isn't. I see, is, is, isn't supportive yeah. of them. I see. Yeah. Um, yeah, that does happen. And I think um, it's happened it to me. To like, almost, even if I think back in right? my career, it you know, when I first... Too. What's that? Yeah. It happened to me too. Yeah. Well, and maybe you have an idea here that you want to share. My story, like when I think about this, the time when this, the times when this has ha- have happened most is when I get promoted amongst my peers, which has happened a few times and they don't really trust me yet. It's sort of, well, why should you have gotten this job? And I didn't. Um, and what usually happens is because I try too quickly to change things or to assume they're going to respect me. So I think about what I try to think about here is how do I earn respect of the team? 
how do I show that I'm really in it with them? And it was on one of my slides, but you may not have noticed it. I was a coxswain on the rowing team in high school and college. Oh. I don't know if people know what that is, but you know, on the crew team, the person who sits in the back of the boat and steers and actually is like a little coach for the team. You're you're guiding them in the races, at the pace they should go, and you're coaching them if their oar is going in too fast or at the wrong angle. And it was hard for me to earn the respect of the team because they were working so hard and I wasn't. I was just sitting in the boat. And this is what happens sometimes to managers, especially in engineering or other fields where the team is working hard, doing lots of coding, and the manager is just managing. And people sometimes don't quite have respect for them. And so I would do things like every single workout outside of the boat, I would do it with them. I would run up every sand dune. I would lift every weight. I would get up early in the morning and run with them. And then the other thing I did was try to understand each of them as an individual. So my job as a coxswain is very similar to my job as a manager. I have to understand they each have really different needs and desires and preferences. And the better I understood them as individuals, the better I could coach them. So for instance, in the boat, if someone's oar was going in too fast, one person might just want me to tell it like it is. Like, you have to be faster. Let's say they were too slow. You have to be faster or we're going to lose. And other people might want a little bit more encouragement, like, you're almost there, just a little bit faster. And if you give those two people the opposite type of feedback, they really don't like it. And so a lot of those techniques actually work for managers too. A lot of times it's about really trying to understand the people that we're there to coach and support, showing that we are there for them and on their behalf and earning their respect. And then if they're just jerks, sometimes we fire them. So. <laughs> I love the analogy. It's actually like a sport team, right? A team is like a sport yes. team. Yeah. Yes. And as a manager, you, you don't have one style. You have to have a personalized style for your team member. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's tough to be a manager, right? When you're young, you think, oh, I want to be promoted. I want to be a boss. And then when you become a manager, you, you are challenged with all these people issues. And it's hard. It's a lot. It's hard. Yeah. 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 Especially when you're young and the team members are older than you or they're more experienced than you. That's right. Uh, even if they're your peers before now, they're like, why? <laughs> Hard, especially yeah. when they're your peers. And yes, that was... But I think it's also very rewarding because then you learn and you become a lot better at uh, people. Yeah, That's right. And if you can earn that trust and help yeah. them grow too, it's really rewarding because you see what they are capable of achieving and you know you had a hand in helping them get there. Yeah. you know, organizations that were incredibly psychologically unsafe, it all came to a head and they've come crashing down, so many of mm. them. Getting extreme clarity from your manager on exactly what they expect and what beating their expectations looks like. The more that we're willing to show trust and be vulnerable and ask good questions, the more it rubs off on everyone else around us. That's the most likely thing to lead to success. So my next question for you, Jennifer, is um, is about anti our philosophy here, right? We we both love this culture that is rich in psychological safety, but I still see there are a lot of successful business and organizations achieving their success without this quality in their culture. So what do you think about this? They will only get away with it for so long because really the best talent is not going to work for companies like that. And especially in the environment we're in now, people will leave and, and choose other companies. It's a little less true in the economic environment we're in now where people may have to make harder choices when jobs are less plentiful, but that also won't last forever. So a few years down the line, employees will have the power back and they will choose companies that treat them well and are psychologically safe. The other thing that we talked about in the in my presentation is just that even if you can manage to kind of retain your employees and hire good people, you have to understand that there is a big potential, you know, pitfall potentially right in front of you that you won't notice. This is the mm -hmm. Boeing example and the Wells Fargo example. Like these companies are destined potentially for something quite bad happening with this kind of environment. It's just like, I mean, if you look at 
the entertainment industry, you know, think mm-hmm. about Harvey Weinstein and all of yeah. these examples of these, you know, organizations that were incredibly psychologically unsafe, it all came to a head and they've come crashing down so many of mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. So your prediction is they can only get away with it for a while. <laughs> like for so long. Yeah. yeah that's great. So I, I'm going to ask you to be a little bit vulnerable here. Can you share with us some mistakes you've made as a leader in your path of bu- building a culture of psychological safety? And now in retrospect, what would you have done differently? When I think back, especially earlier in my career, the mistakes I made around this were also mainly because I I didn't know about this concept at all. So I didn't I didn't know that this was something you should be aiming for. And there were some places where I made big mistakes. So one that I think about a lot, when I first graduated from college, I started a nonprofit that was to help kids become their first in their families to go to university. And I raised all the money, I hired the team, and this program ran during the summers. And I, it's funny, this is years and years ago before Before, the, before e-commerce was a big thing. And I used to carry around this piece of paper in my pocket that had a list of items I needed at the store. And the store closed at 9 p.m. And somehow I could never leave work before 9 p.m. And I always had this list in my pocket every day and I would leave and come back and I'd still have the list. And I had a mentor who visited me and I was telling her this story. And I said, you know, I can never get to the store. And she said, what are you doing? And I said, well, my whole staff, they they want to work really late. And I'm the one who has the keys to the building. And so if they want to work really late, what, you know, how can I stop them? And she says, it's not up to them. It's up to you. You know, you're the leader. You have to model that you don't work till nine o'clock every night. <sighs> And it just hadn't occurred to me. I was mistaking silence for agreement, right? And just because they weren't speaking up that they that they wanted to leave earlier because I hadn't left, they wouldn't leave. And it became this vicious cycle of them not feeling safe to say, I'm done working now. And so she really opened my eyes to that. And we actually did this work where we took the mission of my organization and we put it at the top of a piece of paper. And then I put my whole to-do list down the side And we took every item on my to-do list because I said, well, there's so much to do. We have to stay all night. And she said, that's just not true. Take every item on your list and run it by the mission of your company and see, is this really important or not? And I now use a a rowing analogy for this too, because there's a great example of a, a boat from the UK that that was competing in the Olympics, I think in the early 2000s. And they had this process where they they asked themselves this question every day, will it make the boat go faster? That's the equivalent of taking your mission statement and asking the question. And so they said, you know, what are we going to eat for breakfast? Well, will it make the boat go faster if we eat this versus that? Should we practice an extra half hour? Will it make the boat go faster? And so that's the question I use now at at Rising Team and at other companies, same as taking your mission and running it by your to-do list. Will it make the boat go faster is the question. (laughs) And, you know, I learned quickly not to like drive my team into the ground, which I was doing, which is a pretty psychologically unsafe thing to do. So, yeah, yeah. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing. Um, There's a question coming from the chat from Quang, and uh, he has uh, distributed teams and they have bi-weekly all-hands meeting And his question is about, is there any specific activities or other means that the leadership team or HR can do to help fostering a safe space where everyone can freely give their feedback? Yeah. Uh, I have a quick question, yeah. uh, a quick answer here. Use Rising Team. <laughs> Try Rising Team. <laughs> <laughs> We built the whole product specifically for this. Um, yeah. But I'll let Jennifer talk about this. <laughs> yeah, and it basically breaks the team down into groups of you know, 10 or fewer and go, runs them through learning things together where they can speak up, get to know each other, share feedback, et cetera. The challenge with your all hands, and I have the same challenge in my all hands too, is that the bigger it gets, the harder it is to speak up in that environment. And so one of the things we've done, for instance, for all our all hands is add a, an async Q&A feature where people can either anonymously or with their names on it, ask questions 
in between the meetings, just as they come up. Or you might have someone who is the like collector of questions where people don't have to, or it could be questions or feedback or both. It's sometimes hard though, when you have the whole group together to get people to still keep opening up as the group scales. And so things that can help you know, smaller groups, asynchronous collecting of those things, putting things in, in writing, giving people time to write, or asking in advance for people to prepare presentations. So as an example, the festival of failure idea is something that can be used at your all hands. And, and that's why we have the Slack channel for it too. Like, you know, I had an example with an engineer a few weeks ago where he, you know, made some kind of mistake and he was telling me, personally what he had learned. And I said, great, go put this in the festival of failure chat. And he did. And then everybody commented on it. And so you, if you get a couple of those good examples, good role models, and you can find who they are and highlight them. And if you want to highlight them in all hands, that encourages everybody to do more of that. I just want to share a little bit about rising team in my experience, using it as a, a team leader. I really love it because it's opened up, especially the first module about psychological safety, which is the first one that we did as a team. It really opened up people to feel a lot more comfortable to share what they feel and how they think and the way they want to be worked with, the way they want to be communicated with. So you guys should try it out. And uh, we don't have a lot of time. So this is a quick question uh, for Jennifer from Tuan in the, in the audience. What do you do with... Uh, managers who are micromanager and they're man managing you in that style? Yeah, well, the, the micromanagement generally comes from lack of trust. And the way to deal with lack of trust is to prove that someone can trust you. And so what I suggest here is extreme clarity on expectations. So what I find usually is that lack of trust comes from lack of clarity around what's expected and what's being committed to. And we actually have a session on this in Rising Team 2. It's called Clear Expectations. And we have a little framework that I'll give to you right now. It's called ROAD. It stands for request and measurement. So what is exactly being requested of me? How will I measure if I am successful? And how will I measure if I beat your expectations? So getting extreme clarity from your manager on exactly what they expect and what beating their expectations looks like. The second step is O. So road is request. O is obstacles, which is what are any obstacles that may come up in your path to achieving that those objectives and being able to ask for any support that you might need. So telling your manager in advance or as soon as it comes up, hey, this thing came up that I didn't expect. It's going to change how I I'm able to achieve this objective. Should, should we change it? Should I get your support, et cetera? And then A is alignment, which is once we have those things, we know the exact request and measurement, we know what obstacles might come, we align and commit. And I say, I'm going to commit to you that I can do this by this time and so forth. And D is delivery. So we measure whether it happened. But the reason we call it road is that you can go back down the road at any point. If a new obstacle comes up, you're communicating it. So if you do that kind of work up front, then your manager shouldn't have to micromanage you because they know exactly that you're aligned on what, what they expect that and so forth. And a lot of times the reason this happens is because the managers aren't clear on what they expect. And so you as an individual contributor can go to your manager and demand clarity of expectations, which then if you deliver and you do it a few times in a row, earns enough trust that they usually stop micromanaging you. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, as managers, I don't think a lot of managers like micromanage either. I think yeah, they, they don't. To, they struggle with it. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, we are running out of time. So just one last question to wrap up our whole session today. Um, Jennifer, if I can hire all the billboards in the world and put your message on there <laughs> about building psychological safety, uh, what is that one message you want to send to everyone, especially the managers, the leaders, even the individual contributors, right, about this building this culture? What is that one message? I mean, I think it's that everybody has a role to play. And the more that we act in this way ourselves, the more that we're willing to show trust and be vulnerable and ask good questions, the more it rubs off on everyone else around us. So, you know, be willing to play our part 
in, mm. in building it. And mm. that's the most likely thing to lead to success. Perfect. That's the perfect message to end our session today. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for sharing so generously and so openly uh, about all you know uh, in this um, culture uh, value of psychological safety. And thank you, everyone, for spending the Tuesday morning with us, for asking great questions. I hope you're taking a lot of good notes. Also, I will say just to end that um, if anyone is interested in learning more about Rising Team, you can sign up for a demo. And anyone who signs up for a demo from this session will get special pricing promotion for us um, on the product too. Oh, yes. And we'll send you the information uh, in when we re-air the episode and also in our recap email. So thank you, everyone. Have a great... Thanks for the great questions. Yeah, really good <laughs> questions. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. My pleasure. Thanks. And goodbye. Goodbye, everyone.